Our main feature is the Booker Prize, the £5,000 awarded annually by the company whose interests range from sugar through machinery to books. This year, the prize was divided between two novelists, Nadine Gordimer and Stanley Middleton. And I went along to Claridge's to speak to the winners and also to ask the three-member jury how you tell that one novel is worthy of a prize and one isn't. We keep abreast of nostalgia with Gamage's store catalogue for 1913. But first of all, Margaret Powell and Humphrey Littleton each tell us about a new book, book which this week they felt would give them most pleasure. First of all, Margaret Powell, what did you choose? Uh, well, Robert, I chose a book called The Bottle Factory, Alton, and it's written by Beryl Bainbridge. It's published by Gerald Duckworth of London at a price of £2.35, and believe me, it's a perfectly splendid book. It really is. I don't think that I've read a book which I enjoyed more than I did this one. It's about two perfectly ordinary females, and you might see any day of the week in a, in a supermarket in the street, and yet, they're not perfectly ordinary when you come to read about them. The Bottle Factory is, in, in actual fact, an Italian wine factory, and everybody is in it is Italian except the two girls. And they are Italians who've been imported by, from southern Italy, and they've brought over with them their entire way of life and their entire way of culture. And they don't really understand the girls, and the girls don't understand them. But Frida is big and blousy, very fair-haired, um, would be pretty perhaps if she wasn't quite so fat. Brenda is scraggy, thin, and has no personality at all, and yet it is Brenda who survives. Frida, who is militant and aggressive and fights against um, partly injustices in the factory and, fight and wants to find a niche for herself in life. She wants someone to love her. As she weighs 16 stone, it's a little bit difficult to look what she would like to look is like a pretty little doll. She would like someone to pick her up and comfort her. Brenda is not a bit good looking. She's passive, she lets life flow over her and it's Brenda who survives. And Frida has this marvellous idea that they should integrate with the workers. They should take them out. They should let them see uh, what English countryside is like, what English workers are like. So she f dreams up this bottle factory outing. Partly she dreams of that because she is in love with the manager, who's also Italian. Um, she wants him to fall in love with her, and she thinks that maybe if she goes on this outing, she can visualise herself going to one of these very large stately homes, showing him into all the way that the English aristocracy live, floating down the river in a punt, and gradually making him see that she's not just a bottle factory employee. She has aspirations beyond this. It's very funny also. I mean, it's not at all straight-faced. It's, 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 it's not a long, rambling tale. It's a very, very taut tale. The characterisation is perfect, and uh, the comedy is profound. It's not custard pie comedy at all. Humphrey Littleton, you've read it too. What did mm -hmm. you think of it? Do you share the enthusiasm? Uh, I do indeed, yes. I thought, I thought uh, some of the sort of set scenes were hilariously funny. I thought... Uh, in one or two places, they were a little bit custard pie in the best sense. I mean, the scene when they're all, uh, the van doesn't arrive to take all the workers to this picnic, so they, uh, a few of them cram into these two cars, <laughs> and there's uh, Frida with this, armed with this uh, French loaf, but underlying it still, like isn't it, is this feeling of tragedy, even oh, yes. then. Even then you can sense that the day is not going to turn out ideally in any sense of the word. It was tremendously sad when those who couldn't fit into the little car yes. that they were commandeered in their black suits went sorrowfully but, home, some of them with tears in their yes. eyes. That's right. Yeah. Well, of sad. course, they're very emotional in any case, Italians, as I found when I was over there recently. I mean, they feel things, I think, more. Well, maybe they feel them on the surface more. But than the we two do. girls felt it very much, didn't they? I mean, they were extraordinarily, as you said, idiosyncratic. They weren't at all stereotypical. No, they're very no. idiosyncratic. But just like people are when you get to know them well, they're all, people do become yes. peculiar. The better I mean, you if, know if them. you could have seen Frieda, I would imagine, out in the street, as I say, big and blousy and rather, rather aggressive type, you would never have thought capable of feeling the finer feeling. But she did, mm. even more so than Brenda, far more so. I mean, that, that business of where she's riding that horse, I thought that was fantastic. You could, I could just visualise her in my mind, perched up on there, really at last becoming what she'd all along felt that she was. It, and and the, the last, I couldn't think at the very end, where, of course, she, she gets killed, 
um, how they were going to dispose of Frida. Because let's face it, 16 stone need some disposal. Are you going to give the game away? Or no, do you no, think that, no, I'm not going to give the game away. Now, I think it would be a great shame to give the game away, but it's the only solution, and it's hilarious. I mean, well, it, perhaps it sounds awful to say death is hilarious, but the disposal of Frida really is one of the most hilarious scenes in the book. I, I read criticism which said that the part where they um, carried Frida around um, in the car when she'd had ready died struck a false note, but not to me it didn't. Mm. Uh, to me it was, it fitted in to the bottle factory out in absolutely as it should do. Well, it's a, apparently by the vote of one and all, it's a humane and funny and successful book. And I'm going to ask Humphrey Littleton now about his choice. My choice is the ghost stories of M.R. James, which uh, have been collected together, are published by Edward Arnold at the price of £3.30. And the reason I went to this book is not that I'd read them all before, but that my father, who knew Monty James, because uh, Monty James was the provost of Eton when my father was a housemaster there, and therefore I used to see him floating round in these long, long black sort of cassock that he had to wear round the, the, the school when I was uh, very, very young. But my father read just one of the stories, uh, A Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, which is uh, just from the title alone, I mean, is chilling. And uh, to me is, um, is still the high spot of the book. He read me that one story. He, he used to take uh, some enjoyment in scaring the daylights out of us. And he read it with tremendous uh, rolling of the eyes and, uh, and uh, lowering of the eyebrows and all the rest of it. And I was petrified as a, as a child by this story. And, and cert one scene in it, the scene where down on this beach, uh, East Anglian beach, the, uh, the, the man has a sort of waking dream where he sees, uh, first of all, a fleeing figure hopping over the, the groins, breakwaters, and, and eventually running out of steam and cowering behind one. And then uh, it gradually becomes apparent what he's fleeing from, which is really the stereotyped ghost figure, the sheet with the flapping arms, there, but written so the way, it, the, the way he describes its bobbing movements and it runs yes. down to the seashore and bang. And I was petrified. I had nightmares for days on end after this. And I went back to this collected uh, book with uh, some slight trepidation, afraid that I wasn't going to be so, so scared by it, that it was, wasn't going to be so good. And I must say that I was scared by that one, and I was scared by quite a, a fair proportion of the others. What well, about the mezzo tint, the marvellous one where there's a space in this mezzo tint of ground, a figure in the middle of it, a, a house in the background, and slowly, day by day, the figure approaches closer to the house. Yes. One of the best, I thought. The thing is, uh, that I like about it, is that he describes the things. They are, he doesn't go in for any of your rubbishy um, psychoanalytical horror and all this. I mean, they are uh, the skeleton heads and the, and the thin arms with the grey wispy hairs and all that. They are real uh, traditional materials, but his, his description, I think, is absolutely superb. There's a, that lovely one called Rats, where there's a man in a, in a hotel, in, a, in an inn, who goes into a room that he's not supposed to look into, and there's a bed, nothing in the room except this bed with a, bumps that are moving about <laughs> yeah, and in the shape of a body. And then later, when he's just about to leave, he goes up just to reassure himself and looks in there, and he almost laughs aloud with relief because the, the, what's propped up on the bed is a scarecrow. And then he has these second thoughts. Does a scarecrow have these bare, bony yeah. uh, legs? Does it have this uh, chain round its neck and so on? Does, Tell, it, does it rise up and walk across uh, the room with its head lolling? Beautiful. How did it grab you, Margaret? Oh, appallingly. I, I, I blessed <laughs> Mr. Littleton, not in the best sense, because um, I, I've all, I mean, people always tell you that the things you dream about are deep in the subconscious. Rubbish! I dreamt about these things every night, and I took them to bed with me, and I'd read one, and I think, well, I must just read one more. And I knew I shouldn't read yeah. them, but I did, and I had the most appalling dreams about them. That one, well, I rather like Casting the Runes. I've read yeah. it before. In fact, I've read it three times before. But it's so kind of authentic, because they're written in a kind of archaic language. I don't mean the words are archaic, but the way it's written is archaic It's very in a Edwardian. Way. Yes. It, it, it's much more real to you than it would be if it was all gone and somebody walking around with their hair down of their arm. And, and uh, It's not bloodthirsty. It's, it's, as you say, it's chilling. I think one has to very say, for chilling. people who come to the book new, that it is written primarily for academics. I mean, one of the things was written for the Eton Scout Patrol to be read at their... Uh, uh, camp, 
around the campfire. And um, uh, to me, as an old Etonian, I recognize, I mean, all the master's names are real, and they were, they were put into the thing for laughs, no doubt. Uh, but throughout, these things are written by a, a scholar, by an academic, for academics. They were oh. written for his colleagues and so on. And therefore, you have to weigh past sometimes quite a lot of sort of scholarly, most of, all of it, he says, invented, names of yes. uh, ancient books and papers and things, but well worth, you know, skip them, to hell with that, get to the core yes, of it and scale yourself. Yes. Well, I have a feeling that if it, uh, this sort of thing grabs you when you're, when you're a kid, I, I seem to have read them all myself when I was between the age of 14 and 16, then it stays with you forever. I should say that um, uh, book is published by Edwin Arnold at £3.30, but you can get most of it under the title Ghost Stories of an Antiquary in Penguin at the moment for 50 pence. Margaret Powell and Humphrey Little, thank you very much. The Booker Prize then. Well, uh, the Booker Prize for the best full-length novel of the year was presented on Wednesday to the South African novelist Nadine Gordimer and Nottingham school teacher, novelist also, Stanley Middleton. The cheque for £2,500 each was a splendid bonus since any novel, however high its quality, is lucky if it earns the author the few hundred pounds he receives as an advance against royalties. At the presentation, therefore, all was frolic, feast and fun. The Booker Prize confers cash on the winner, publicity on the donor, and it may be this business-like division of benefit which in the past has made some of the recipients disinclined to roll over and have their stomachs scratched into the bargain, though this year's winners seemed perfectly content. At the presentation, commerce and letters sat cheek by jowl. Kingsley Amis was shortlisted for his novel Ending Up, a study of old people in a fearfully enclosed community of themselves. So too, and for the second time, was Beryl Bainbridge for her splendidly humane story, The Bottle Factory Outing. The judges were Antonia Byatt, the writer and lecturer, Ian Truin, literary editor of The Times, and Elizabeth Jane Howard, the novelist. Truin, chairman of the panel, then announced the winners. Now the result. The £5,000 Booker Prize for Fiction for 1974 has been awarded jointly to Nadine Gordimer for her novel, The Conservationist, and Stanley Middleton for his novel, Holiday. Many congratulations. Here's the envelope, and here is the Thank you very much. Nadine Gordimer was born in South Africa. In fact, she's a native of Johannesburg. She spoke of other prizes she'd won. I'm very amused and interested to see how prizes change their value. I'm not talking about the money value, but depending upon whether you've got them or not. <laughs> Years ago, more than, more than a decade ago, I got the W.H. Smith Award, and I was very pleased. And my friends, my literary friends in London, said to me, oh, darling, it's marvellous. I mean, the money's lovely, a thousand quid, it's very nice. But, you know, it's, it's a very commercial prize. I mean, it's not much prestige. So I took the thousand pounds and let the prestige go. And they said, well, you know, the, the prizes that really matter are things like the Hawthorne, Hawthorne Prize, and the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. Well, some years went by, and then I got the James Tate Black Prize. And uh, then friends said to me, oh, of course, it's a sweet old-fashioned prize, but, you know, it doesn't really count. <laughs> <laughs> the only prize that counts is the Booker Prize. And so I'm waiting to see what happens now. <laughs> Stanley Middleton writes of a man who leaves his wife and spends a week, the holiday of the title, at a seaside boarding house, fumbling for some sort of perspective on an unsatisfactory marriage. Nadine Gordimer's story is set in South Africa, and the title, The Conservationist, sums up the central character, a man who seeks to conserve his material prosperity and the power it brings him in order to go on feeling that he's real. 
I spoke to each of the jurors in turn. Elizabeth Jane Howard's husband, Kingsley Amis, was a contender for the prize, and I wondered if her fellow judges had found this bothersome. Well, other members of the jury found no difficulty about this. Uh, if they had, I would, I think this would have been very difficult for me. But I think we were all agreed that this was part of the professional game, really, that uh, it just turned out that way. I'm sure no one doubted that justice would be done, but did you feel that justice would be seen to be done? Well, yes, because, you see, the National Book League sit in on it. So I did feel that, as I said in my letter, that justice was seen to be done. But my husband doesn't have the same view as me about this, because when he was uh, judging the Whitbread Prize, I was up for that prize. And he refused to consider me at all because he was my husband. So our views about this aren't the same anymore. It didn't worry me once I thought about it for a long time because I realised that what Jane felt about that novel came right from her critical faculties, not from just the fact that she was the wife of Kingsley Amis. But you couldn't be sure of that. That's to say, you were convinced of it, but justice wasn't seen to be done. Yeah, I think justice was seen to be done in the sense that there are three judges and two of them aren't married to Kingsley Amis. Was there at any point um, a hung jury? Where Was there a, a deep divide at any time at all? It's interesting. We, I think we had very little difficulty in getting to some sort of shortlist. I think we got to eight books without much problem. Getting from eight to at least six, the maximum we could have had for a shortlist was six. Getting down to that six was very difficult. At the end of the first meeting, I think we had got six or seven, and we decided we'd go away and have a fortnight off, and we would read those seven novels again, because if you read 51 novels over a period of time, you didn't begin to forget the ones you read at the beginning. And we did read the seven or whatever it was again a second time. In one case, I read it the third time. And Martin Gordimer, one of the winners, uh, is a novel that you can't digest in one sitting, I think. It's got one of those great things about it that you can go on reading it. It's like an onion, you know, that you can peel off the layers. Um, so that as far as a hung jury is concerned, I don't think it ever was any point at all. When we got to the final, we had to decide, and we worked out all sorts of procedures, what would happen. Would we have a point system where we might say that if there were uh, five books in the end on that final shortlist, if we marked them giving five for the top and one for the bottom, and see what would happen if you added up the three, just to like see what... It sounds like this world. It sounds like it. It wasn't a bit like it, because we then threw it away and decided that it wasn't a very satisfactory answer, uh, because we all agreed it wasn't satisfactory. It was very interesting, this, that the whole time we decided that all the sort of formulae didn't work. It was debate in the end that was the thing that was what, I think, decided this. What do you suppose the significance of these prizes to be, such prizes as this? I think the major significance is simply publicity for the novelist, the readers who hadn't heard the name of the novelist will now hear it, and some will read it, and some of those who read it will understand what the novelist was trying to do. I, um, I, don't, well, I wouldn't put it higher than that. I'm not sure we've picked this year as winners the books which will turn out to be what I would call literature, and I teach literature in a university. I am sure we have picked two very good books which deserve to be discussed, and I'm sure that winning the prize will cause both of them to be more discussed than they would have been. Then I spoke to the two winners, first asking Nadine Gordimer what the significance of the prize was as far as she was concerned. Well, um, it hasn't any particular significance, I think, that, um, no, perhaps that's not quite truthful. I do, do respect it. I think that it, it means something in um, contemporary English literature. And for that reason, I'm pleased to be um, a co-winner of this year's prize. But it hasn't any particular significance vis-a-vis -vis my own work, what I want to do, what I think I've done. This is always a very private judgment. What of you? Well, I think this, that three professional judges who stand to gain very little from it have looked at these books, and they chose mine and Nadine's. Um, and so I'm pleased that they've done this. Um, writing's a lonely business, you're sitting there looking at a blank bit of paper, and when sometimes you hear from outside somebody saying, not too bad, um, you're pleased. I don't think it'll affect my next novel, um, and uh, in the very slightest, but this signal has done me good. You've won prizes before. Would you have supposed this book might have done? To be quite honest, I, I didn't ever 
think about it. And I think, I don't know any writer who, who would think about it, because who knows? It isn't like some sort of competition that one enters. But that's Architects. how it ends up. Yes, but you see, the, it's not of your volition. You write the book, um, I often think the best way for a writer to work, the ideal way, is to write as if everything that you're going to do is going to be published posthumously. And in a sense, I think this is how we all work. As soon as you have your one eye on some so-called audience, it's the end of you. You can see this in writers' work. You can see what happens to them when they begin to, to write for an audience or a purpose. Is it the one you would expect to get a kind of special pat on the back for? This novel? Uh, well, if you mean, is it my favourite novel of all those I've written, the answer would be no. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, I didn't award the prize myself. It was left to other people to judge that. And I'll tell you something about the width of my novels, but it's not my job to tell you about the quality. Well, there you are. That's how the Booker Prize was bestowed for this year.